This podcast is free and it's accessible to everyone thanks to support from listeners like you. If you value this show, please consider supporting its production by donating to our home, KUOW. It only takes a minute to give and you'll be helping to support the production of this podcast. Make a donation at KUOW.org or follow the link in the show notes. And thanks. I'm on this game trail that goes around the edge of the pond, like literally a circle right around the small lake. I did this recording a couple of weeks ago out camping. I came across something strange on the trail. And uh, there's a little um, aspen sapling here. And I thought, look at that. The branches are covered in ants. And these ants are black abdomen and red heads and a variety of different sizes. And they're walking up and down this stem here. But not just ants. As I bend down to get a closer look, I notice something else. The stem is covered in little black bugs, aphids, and the ants are crawling all over them. And it looks like they're caring for or taking the aphids or eggs of some sort. Can't quite figure out what it is. I'm going to look this up. It's fascinating. The perfect opportunity to come home and find out more, do some research. And what I found was too good to keep to myself. The ants I saw were definitely not just hanging out on a twig full of aphids. Let me take you on a journey into what I discovered, into the world of the ant. These just might be the tiniest farmers on earth. From KUOW in Seattle, I'm Chris Morgan. Welcome to Wild Bites. I'm Alex Schwartz. I'm Nomi Fry. I'm Vincent Cunningham, and this is Critics at Large, a New Yorker podcast for the culturally curious. Each week, we're going to talk about a big idea that's showing up across the cultural landscape, and we'll trace it through all the mediums we love. Books, movies, television, music, art. And I always want to talk about celebrity gossip, too. Of course. We hope you'll join us for new episodes each Thursday. Follow Critics at Large today, wherever you get podcasts. Ants have always fascinated me. In fact, some of my earliest memories of wild creatures are playing with ants in my granny's front garden in England while the rest of the family was tucking into Easter lunch inside. I was about three years old, and the fascination never left me. I still never walk past an ant nest without getting down on all fours and watching them. So far, more than 12,000 ant species have been discovered, and they completely outnumber us. For every human being on Earth... There are about one and a half million ants. The reason I love ants so much is there's so much diversity. That's Dr. Cory Morrow, a professor of entomology at Cornell University. Even though you might look at them on the sidewalk and think they're really small and they don't look all that different, once you get them under a microscope, I mean, they're spectacular. I agree. Ants form really complex social structures in massive colonies, thousands, hundreds of thousands of them. They call them superorganisms, and they work together, and they are very good at solving problems, including how to find food. What I saw that day on the branch by the lake was an amazing example of it. I was watching ants tending to their flock. These ones were western thatching ants, common in North America. Their big red heads make them look like the Vikings of the ant world. Lots of different species of ants will actually tend sap-sucking insects. Now, the aphids are sort of the ones that we're most used to seeing because, you know, they're often attacking our rose bushes or we find them out on our, our produce if we're growing a little garden. These aphids, sometimes called green fly or black fly, can become a real pest because they crave plant sap. So they fly around, sometimes for hundreds of miles with the help of the wind, until they find a good-looking plant to feed on. Then they land and stick their sharp, beak-like mouth into the plant, like a little straw, and they use that straw to drink up the juicy sap. But as you can imagine, the juice starts coming in so fast that they can't drink it quick enough. It's sort of like if we took a straw, put it into a fire hose, but then the straw was glued to our mouth. The water coming through would be so rapid. Now there's an image. Some smart aphid evolution has come up with a solution, though. A body that can deal with this high sap flow. 
Some of the sap follows the regular digestion path, gets processed and turned into food for the aphid. But the other path is sort of a shortcut. It's almost a complete mouth to anus shortcut. It's sort of bypassed into a tube that doesn't go directly through the digestive tract and almost goes directly to the anus unchanged or untransformed. A complete mouth to anus shortcut. <laughs> That's a conversation starter. And at the anus end, there's someone waiting. An ant. Because what comes out of the aphid is sweet, sugary goodness. Honeydew. The ants are essentially drinking almost directly from the plant without having to have a straw mouth themselves. This honeydew is irresistible to ants. Anything sweet is. It's why they're in your kitchen or all over that watermelon at the campground. Ants have even figured out how to milk the aphids. They stroke the aphids' bodies with their antennae, their, their feelers, and this stimulates the aphids to excrete the sweet stuff right into the mouth of the ant or sometimes onto their legs to drink later. The aphids become like miniature sugar processing plants for the ant. The ants really are walking over the backs of the aphids, you know, guarding them and checking on them really diligently, fussing over them. And who wouldn't? This honeydew can be their main source of food during the aphid season. So here's where the ants take the dairy farming one step further. The ants, over time, you know, a few million years, have figured out how to make this honeydew a sustainable food source. And they do it by keeping the aphids captive. The ants excrete a chemical from their feet right onto the plant. And when the aphids land on the chemical, they slow down, become kind of zombie-like. I guess it's their form of building a fence, right? So we keep all of our, you know, our herds in fences. They don't have fences, so they have to find another mechanism. This invisible mechanism works. Research has actually measured the speed of aphids walking across a sheet of paper, and they were way slower, one-third slower, when they were on paper that had been walked on by ants. As the ants tend to their herd, the aphids actually increase the production of honeydew with smaller drops and greater concentrations of amino acids. I mean, the ants even move the aphids around to the most productive part of the plant. And at the end of the day, they'll actually take their cattle and herd them down the plant, tuck them into a safe chamber in the soil, and then wander back to their nests. And then the next morning when they wake up, they wander back, pick up their cattle and move them to a new part of the plant so that they can keep, you know, sucking on these plant juices. And then the ants get their special sugary treat. It seems like the ants will stop at nothing to get their sweet reward. Even when the aphids try to fly away, the ants will bite their wings right off. A bit like a farmer might clip the wings of a chicken. Occasionally, things can get even worse for the aphids. Ants eat them. Maybe it's a protein craving after all that sugar. Sometimes what they'll do is they'll actually just move the scale insects inside the ant nest that's located inside of a living tree. And then they don't even have to herd them up or down. They essentially just have snacks, their refrigerator, right next to the couch. TV ant dinners. Now, none of this seems very good for the aphids being drugged, moved around, and occasionally eaten. But actually, there's something in it for them too. Aphids have predators like ladybugs and lacewings, and this is where the ants step in. They are the perfect protection. In ecology, it's called mutualism, when two species work together and they both benefit from the arrangement. Like those birds you see hopping about on the back of a zebra. The bird gets a meal, and the zebra enjoys a bit of pest control. Here on the branch, the ant gets the meal, and the aphid gets protection. The ants become aphid bodyguards. Also, if they're not milked, aphid honeydew can develop a toxic fungus. So the ants are actually helping by drinking the honeydew before that happens. This mutualistic partnership might still seem a bit lopsided in the ants' favour, but it's still a pretty good deal for the aphids. Often you'll have one partner who's gaining a little bit more of a benefit than the other, and in some situations they actually even sort of coerce or force one of the partners to remain in this symbiotic relationship, even if it isn't always beneficial to that partner. It does seem like some days the ants are more like mafia kidnappers than attentive farmers. But lopsided or not, there's something kind of endearing about this mutualism. 
It's like a little soap opera, this two-way relationship between species, all playing out in the drama of life on a little twig. Thank you to ant expert Dr. Corrie Morrow for her help with this episode. A very special thank you for their kind financial support to Ellen Ferguson, Jill and Scott Walker, Anna Kimball, John Taylor, and Annie Mines. The Wild is inspired not just by nature, but by people who work in it, love it, protect it. We have more information on our website, thewildpod.org. The Wild is a production of KUOW in Seattle, Wildlife Media, and me, Chris Morgan. Our producer is Matt Martin. Jim Gates is our editor. Our production team includes David Brown, Juan Pablo Chiquiza, April Craig, Tio Popescu, Mariah Powell, Brendan Sweeney, and Jeannie Yandel. Our theme music is by Michael Parker. I'm your host, Chris Morgan. Thanks so much for listening, and take care. Take care.